it's it's a huge honour to be here, um, and, and especially with Jonathan. I love the whole theme of diversity and having two speakers, and maybe we should have uh, 20 or 200 up here. But there's just a couple of points that Jonathan mentioned that I wanted to elaborate on uh, very briefly, even though I'm going to be talking about the soil. Oh, thank you. Yes, one of these. Um, and that's about the diversity, like in the human gut microbiome and the parallels between that and the soil microbiome, and obviously also the things that Jonathan's been talking about above ground. And uh, there's a project called the American Gut Project, which is a citizen science, citizen science project that's been running since 2012. And they've analysed 11,000 faecal samples and correlated human health with the diversity of your gut microbiome. And one of the key findings that came out of that is that we need to eat at least 30 different kinds of plants every week to have a healthy gut microbiome. And I am finding incredible difficulty trying to get three while I'm here in the United States. So I think that when we're just to, I thought I'll just mention that first up in case I forget to mention it later. But when we're talking about diversity and microbes and um, and, and the health of living systems, don't forget about ourselves, about human health, and about the fact that there are some things that need to change uh, in terms of human health in the United States. But anyway, now we're go I'm going to talk uh, a little about soil, and I just wanted to reiter reiterate really quickly uh, on what I said yesterday, and then uh, continue on with that, just to reset the stage, and that was that the presence of green plants is the most important factor for soil health. And now that we're talking about all the things that live underground, we're talking about the soil microbiome. And just as green plants are actually very important for our health as well, and a whole lot of different ones. I had an interview in California just recently, and I was uh, talking about the American Gut Project, and the guy that was interviewing me said, we eat 40 to 60 different kinds of plants every day. So I thought, all right, okay, so we need a little bit of, um, it, it obviously is possible. So just talking about soil, because green plants are important for soil because it's actually photosynthesis that's going to um, capture light energy, transform it to biochemical energy and keep that incredible soil microbiome alive. And it's all the interactions between everything in the soil microbiome that actually make it function. So uh, as Jonathan was saying, it's not just about numbers, it is about interactions, but we need to have a whole lot of different kinds of things in there in order to get those interactions, in order to get it to function effectively. So when we're looking at the health of soil, we really need to be, uh, there's not much, we're not in control of what happens to soil. It's photosynthesis and the roots and the microbes that are in charge of what happens to soil. But we can do a lot about photosynthesis. And if we just look at this uh, figure here, if we start, on the left hand side and see that healthy soil is soil that is covered with green plants and what we've done in agriculture not only in this country but around the world globally is that we've removed that ground cover either through overgrazing or through chemical use or tillage or something we have lost the amount of green and the amount of diversity we have hugely simplified the landscape and now we're over there right on the right hand side where we've got soils that have lost their carbon, lost their diversity, lost their microbial communities. We've got massive increases in evaporation and uh, aridity. Uh, it's like a lot of the climate change that we're experiencing now is we, we are the people, not necessarily through uh, the burning of fossil fuels, although that's part of it, but through our landscape management. And what we need to be figuring out is how to get back the other way and not just to have more green, but how to have more diversity in that green, because it is going to have enormous impacts for the health of this planet and for the health of ourselves and the, all of the other things that live on this planet with us. So as I said yesterday, it's green plants that we're talking about that are going to be uh, the primary agents there in, in capturing light energy and transforming it and turning uh, weathered rock minerals into fertile topsoil, but a whole lot more than that. This clicker doesn't, it's either me or the... I don't seem to have much luck with these things. Um, so, as I mentioned also yesterday, we want to look to see whether there are actually, when we see all that soil sticking around plant roots, that tells us that there's an enormous amount of biological activity happening in that soil because this is microbes. This is microbes producing glues and gums to stick soil particles together and form those rhizoshees. This is microbes working together collectively, thousands of different kinds of microbes. Like how are they communicating? How are they figuring this out? 
How do they know that if they stick soil particles together and, and create a different environment around plant roots that that plant is now going to function more effectively because it can uh, obtain all the nitrogen it needs, all the phosphorus it needs, all the potassium, all the calcium, magnesium, sulfur, boron, um, copper, cobalt, zinc, all of those things that it needs, it has to have this interaction with microbes in order to obtain those. And then if that plant can grow uh, more abundantly, it can photosynthesize more and feed more sugars into the soil and support more microbes. It's like, a, you know, a positive feedback loop and we're interfering with that all of the time with uh, the chemicals and things that we use and also just not understanding about this most simple process of photosynthesis and then how it in, uh, feeds into the soil microbiome. I also showed this photo yesterday and I'm showing it again now because I want you to imagine in a little while I'm going to talk about these hyphal uh, strands, these, these hyphae of fungi and how they can actually extend not just from the plant root out to those soil particles around the plant root but way, way out through the ecosystem, through the soil ecosystem, sometimes even 20 metres away from where a plant is and I'm going to get to that later but I just thought I'd show this photo now to remind you that what we're talking about when we talk about photosynthesis is everything in the soil that is supported by photosynthesis and producing these kinds of aggregates in soil that we are going to be the, function, the uh, fundamental unit really of soil health and one of the Jonathan was talking about function and really it's the function is what we see um, because we can't see all the little things that are happening in us or we can't see the, the bacteria and the fungi. And if you look at that uh, the figure on your right, that is a soil that is well aggregated because it has lots of biological activity in it. It is microbes that have produced the sticky substances to make those macro aggregates in soil and therefore create all the spore, pore spaces between the aggregates where water can infiltrate, air can move, little animals can move, little invertebrates can move, plant roots can grow. If, if on the left-hand side you have soil that's not aggregated, it becomes compact, water doesn't infiltrate, and the function of the entire ecosystem changes if we have compacted soil. So these microbes are incredibly important to the function for many physical, chemical and biological reasons. And I showed this photo yesterday too. Sorry to just be going over this ground, but I think it's important just to refresh ourselves about, you know, why photosynthesis is important. Uh, this is one that I just took in California last week. And it's just the difference between the soil that was uh, doesn't have any photosynthesis happening in it and the soil where even if there was just a weed growing there, then you have... Um, on your left hand side you have the soil that is aggregated from underneath that bindweed and the soil that's not aggregated where it doesn't have any plants. And we talked about, um, sorry, I just, me and clickers just don't really get on. <coughs> sorry, it's not going to come up. Okay, so we, I talked about that yesterday and how the fact that in there we are forming humus, which this is one of the most important things that the microbes in your soil do because your humus has high cation exchange capacity, um, it's high water holding capacity, it is really basis, the basis of the sorts of things that you want your soil to do. All the functions that we as livestock producers or crop producers, everything we want our soil to do for us is going to depend on how much humus we have and this is a biological product. How much humus you have is going to depend on how well biological activity is proceeding in your soil and that is going to depend, I'm going to get to the point, is going to depend on plant diversity. So this uh, fertile humus rich topsoil um, that we want to build is actually a product of photosynthesis and microbial resynthesis and the soil organic carbon is actually just the one thing that we can measure easily in soil that's going to tell us the most about soil health but we have to figure out well how are we going to get the most of that and it's important because of the water holding capacity uh, the nutritional status of the plants and therefore the animals and the people um, and it, this is going to be the key driver. So if we were just going to measure one thing in soil it would be the amount of stable soil carbon that's forming there but we have to know how to actually inc accelerate the rate or I like the fact that this conference is about amplifier. So how we get more of that and how do we get that the fastest? 
really if we're just concentrating on. So what are some simple things we can do? We need more stable soil carbon and what are the principles we can use to get there the fastest? Well, we know root inputs build carbon five times faster than any other kind of uh, carbon allocation like you know, above ground biomass like breakdown of organic matter doesn't actually build stable soil carbon, particularly not at depth, or doesn't build very much. So what can we use, what we know about that to actually build this healthy, porous, carbon-rich topsoil? Well, it doesn't matter what it is that you're producing, you are basically a light farmer. So what we're concentrating on is how to uh, convert light into energy and then we're going to sell it like when, you, when you're selling a product whether it's vegetables or beef or grain you are just selling packaged sunlight but we also in that process of selling packaged sunlight we want to be building soil as well and there's only two rules for that i'm just trying to simplify this it's not really that complicated <clears throat> we have to build photosynthetic capacity sorry A little bit of whiskey always helps in the morning. Uh, we have to build photosynthetic capacity and photosynthetic rate. And these things are really quite different. Um, how much time have I got, Russ? Two minutes. So. Oh, okay, that's fine. Right, because I don't want to miss out on the most important thing. But capacity and rate are totally different. Capacity is just like how much green leaf is there that's intercepting sunlight <clears throat> and... <clears throat> How much green leaf is intercepting light and transforming it into biochemical energy? Obviously, there's none there. And even in just going to no-till without green plants, there's none there. So this is one of the big things I think we've really missed out on in agriculture, is thinking that if we, if we change from cultivation to not cultivating, that we're going to build soil. We've been no-till, pretty much all the farmers in Australia have been no-till since about 1970. It was adopted very, very quickly in our country. There's been no net increase in soil carbon since no-till was adopted in Australia. And then everyone said, well, no-till doesn't work. Well, the problem was they didn't have any photosynthesis. So some people have gone to uh, keeping their green plants as well as having no-till, and then these are the guys that are seeing big increases in carbon. But when we talk about photosynthetic rate now, not just photosynthetic capacity, we realise that it's uh, there's a lot more to it than just having... Uh, green plants here because when we actually look at this liquid carbon pathway this transfer of energy from plants down into the soil uh, we see that it functions in two directions and that as carbon is moving from plants into the soil we have nutrients moving from the soil to the plants and therefore into the food chain and um, there are a lot of things that affect how fast that occurs so Basically, that's just that's another NRCS diagram of the red arrows showing carbon and sugars coming down from the plant into the soil ecosystem. The yellow uh, lines are the roots of that plant, and then the purple or blue dots around are the uh, just the microbial communities around those plant roots. And then we've got water and minerals going back into the plant. So this is how it functions in two directions. But the way that we can measure how quickly that is happening, oh, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong one, um, is that if we, if the green arrow that's going up, showing water and minerals going up into the plant, that will actually affect the photosynthetic rate of that plant. And we can determine photosynthetic rate by using a refractometer to measure bricks. And bricks is uh, simply a determination of the dissolved solids in the sap of the plant. So if there are more dissolved solids, more trace elements and minerals going in there and more glucose being formed in photosynthesis, the BRICS levels will be higher. That means that the nutritional value of these plants, if we were just looking at this from a livestock production perspective, this is a figure from, um, it's Alan Williams and you, Russ, is it? Oh, it's Alan's data. Yeah, showing that the impact of forage quality on average daily gain. So the BRICS is along the the bottom axis, so you can see it starts at 1%, goes up to 26%. That's basically telling you the percentage of dissolved solids in the sap of that plant. And as that BRICS level increases, there is much higher average daily gain in animals. So why is that? So it's not about how necessarily how much biomass they're producing. It's not about how much, I mean, dry matter is important. They have to have a certain daily intake of, 
intake of dry matter, but the concentration of nutrients in that dry matter is going to determine their average daily gain. And, you know, so many times when I was talking about nitrogen yesterday, I said you can take a pasture that's normally this high and you can add nitrogen and it grows this high, but you don't get twice the animal production out of it. In fact, you might get less because it now doesn't have the important trace elements, elements and minerals in it that it needs. So this is a, I just love this graph um, because it shows how important that um, what we're really talking about now is the function of the soil microbiome and the functioning of the soil community because it's those things that are going to get that nutrition into those plants and give you those high bricks levels. And so the two most important things that you probably need to have are a spade to look at your plant roots. You should just always be digging holes and looking at your soil, looking at your plant roots and a refractometer to see how fast your plants are photosynthesizing. There's a lot of detail obviously goes into that and uh, about how to, how to um, do your BRICS readings, but I haven't got time to describe today. But so what, what I'm talking about now when I'm talking about photosynthetic rate is actually how fast a plant is photosynthesizing and what are the factors that impact on that. So and if we want to increase photosynthetic rate, then it's not enough just to have green plants. This is what we've discovered, that there is a whole lot more to this and plant diversity really matters when it comes to photosynthetic rate. So this is a photo from Birdwell and Clark Ranch in Texas. And if you have a look at the, um, a little closer at the forage underneath that um, steer there, you'll see that it's not just grasses. There's a whole heap of little flowers and other things all through that forage. We call them grasslands, but really, um, there's, a, there's a lot more than grasses and in fact grasses are often a minor component. So when we stand on soil we're actually standing on the rooftop of another world that uh, again another NRCS diagram of some of the different kinds of plants in, an, in a native prairie and the root systems on those different kinds of plants. But a lot of those things are non-grasses. And what we find is that uh, if we look at our Australian native grasslands, we had 300 to 500 plant species in those. Around 40% were grasses and around 60% were forbs or dicots or broadleaves, whatever you want to call them. And just here in the last week um, at Carol Sparks Place in Montana, she had 120 species that she's documented on her prairie. 47 of those were grasses and 73 non-grasses. So again, just came up as that 60% non-grasses. These are things that usually have flowers on them. And then Alan Williams was telling me yesterday that to date, um, or his, at his last county, had 52 species in his grassland. Only 17 of those were grasses. So 35 or 67% were non-grasses. We just have to get away from thinking about grasses all the time when we're thinking about grasslands um, because there's a lot of other things in there that are very important. We actually need more flowers. And uh, I don't know whether Gabe is here today, but I was really impressed with Gabe's chaos garden where he had a whole lot of vegetables growing together. Um, everything just thrown, all the seeds just thrown into the drill and, and sown without fertiliser or any kind of herbicides. And he had flowers throughout that whole mix. And I kind of took that idea home. And um, this is my vegetable garden. I have flowers. You see there's a ladybird there um, on the purple flower. And also I just love having everything mixed in together and putting flowers in there. Just I always love growing vegetables, but when I've got vegetables with flowers in there as well, just it makes it so much nicer. I mean, you know, we just are forgetting about flowers in, a, in our ecosystem, in our food production ecosystems. This is a cane farmer in, uh, in Queensland. Sugar cane takes two years or three years. It's a perennial grass. It's two or three years before it's harvested. It will actually be over those men's heads when it's mature. But in the early stages of growth, the rows are a long, long way apart and, and it's a slow growing perennial grass. All that bare ground gets uh, colonised by weeds and people use lots and lots and lots of herbicide and then because they're using so much herbicide they're killing off all their beneficial insects and everything and the other poisons that they're using in there and then they get all kinds of pests and diseases and they use, um, you know, insecticides and fungicides. They use a lot of mercury in the cane and it's like a totally, totally toxic environment and then all those chemicals end up on our Great Barrier Reef. As I was saying yesterday, we've killed 73% of the Great Barrier Reef through the chemicals we use in agriculture, including including nitrogen. 
This farmer decided that is actually a 12-way mix that is sown in the interrows, but the sunflowers are the most uh, obvious component of that. His neighbours think he's totally mad, of course. Growing sunflowers in your cane, wouldn't you think that he was totally mad? But he doesn't have to use any pesticides, insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, fertilisers, anything. And he ha is producing fantastic cane because he's now got this biodiversity in there. And if you've got rows that are this far apart, why on earth would you not put something in there? Like, why do we think that that is so strange? Why do we think that's so weird, what he's doing? Really, having those big bare spaces with nothing growing, is they're the ones that are strange. And over time, I think we're starting to realise that hopefully this kind of thing will become the norm. Uh, again, in vineyards, like why have bare ground between vineyards? The people that are putting flowers in their vineyards are finding they don't need to use insecticides, they don't need to use as much water, they've reduced evaporation, they've improved their soil, the water that they do apply, you know, infiltrates better, et cetera, et cetera. So all these things about, and, and mostly it's about the flowers. You've got prairie strips here in the United States in your corn. I think I've read that you can have up to 10% of the corn in prairie strips uh, and still maintain the same yield in the rest of your, your cornfield. So, you know, 10% of it being given over to flowers. This is a close-up of a prairie strip. These are all native prairie plants that are in there. And again, mostly flowers. I just, I see so many examples now of people incorporating diversity into their agricultural operations. And again, uh, uh, what, what, what they're seeing in those prairie strips too, because of the flowers is... Um, much more insects, much more butterflies, more bees and more birds. Jonathan mentioned, you know, everything's connected to everything else. One of the main things these farmers um, comment on is how many birds they've now got on their farms. So we can maybe not necessarily go back to the prairie, but we can try to uh, mimic the function by having, as if we're talking forages now, like as many different kinds of plants in our forage mixes as possible. Um, and at least you want to have 10 or more. Um, I know some people have given advice that if you're going to go into multi-species, just start with three or four or something, but honestly, you're going to miss out on so many benefits on that you really need to have 10 or more. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, how long have I got now, Russ? Oh my goodness, this was the main bit, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> is um, I keep thinking I've got a pointer and I haven't. Um, is how these plants are joined underground with a common mycorrhizal network. So I showed you that photo before of the fungal hyphae that go from the plant root out into the soil. Well, in actual fact, those hyphae extend for a long way beyond those plants and all of these plants in a mixture are joined underground by a common mycorrhizal network so that the plants with the deep tap roots, for example, that might be bringing things up from way down in the subsoil, uh, they can share those nutrients with other plants a long way away. And in a forest ecosystem where most of this work has been done, we can see that, you know, trees like from me to, to over there or even further are actually exchanging nutrients and water via these common mycorrhizal networks. And um, yeah, maybe later I'll expand on that because I'm going to run out of time now. It's a common mycorrhizal network. There's been quite a lot of research done on this now. And you see that um, there is a, an example of a sorghum plant and then its root system and then a flax plant and its root system. And all those little blue lines that are in there, they're the mycorrhizae that are joining those plants together. People have been looking like which plants invest most carbon into the network, which plants utilise most of the energy or most of the uh, nutrients. But I... I'm just going to skip over that now other than to show you that it exists because there's a few things that I I wanted to show you. Sorry, I'm just going to pass on that. So that, that was just an experiment with two, like, a, like a sorghum and flax. But in diverse plant communities, of course, we have multiple plant hosts, multiple fungal partners, and even just like looking at fungal spores in the soil, it's just fascinating to see how many shapes and colours and all these uh, gives you some idea of just of the diversity of fungi that can can be in the soil and what an amazing ecosystem it is in the world. It, it is um, that we, you know, that we're totally unaware of as a general rule. But does this community respond differently once we cross a threshold of how many different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria and those kinds of things are in that community? And the evidence suggests that the more different kinds we have in there, that there is a threshold. And once we cross that threshold, 
the whole network responds differently and, uh, and some really amazing things start to happen. Uh, one of the first people that noticed this was Jay Fuhrer in, uh, when he was with the Burley County Soil Conservation District and they did an, an experiment in 2006 which turned out to be a drought year where they had a whole lot of uh, cover crops grown as monocultures and this is just a photo of the oilseed radish. Um, I think there were eight different cover crop varieties grown as a monoculture and in that drought year they all failed where they were grown as a monoculture. You can see that that's not very productive radish there. But when they put the eight species together as a polyculture, that photo is taken on the same day. So eight species growing together, no sign of drought. What is going on there? How can that happen? And I see this time and time again. These photos I took in Alberta in 2015. This is triticale grown as a monoculture. Again, it's on a demonstration farm. Right next to it is a polyculture with triticale grown at the same rate all through it and planted at the same time. Everything is the same, but this has got another nine species in with it. If you want to find more information about that, if you go to Amazing Carbon, my website, the first article is called Light Farming and that photograph is in Light Farming and there's a description of the species that are in that mix. So this is what the triticale looks like when it's got nine other things in with it in a drought. So what is going on there? What is the soil microbiome doing? How is diversity impacting on the drought tolerance of those plants? That's what it is. As a monoculture, widely spaced plants, you think these ones intuitively, you'd think, or, or just logically, you'd think they should have more water. They should be growing better when that's the only thing that's there, but you put them all together and look, no drought. Uh, I was sent a photo just the other day from uh, Oklahoma, from Brett Preshek, who's with Green Cover Seeds in Oklahoma. This strip, can you see the darker strip just in front of you uh, is sorghum grown as a monoculture and it's starting to drought. See how the leaves are starting to curl? So it's looking quite darker because the leaves are heat stressed. That's sorghum grown on its own. And then right next to it, we have sorghum actually at a much higher, the sorghum is at um, this one was at 400, this one was at 400,000 plants there per acre. This is a million plants per acre with 45 species in with it and there is no sign of any drought stress. So how can you have a higher plant population, 45 species in a mix and no drought stress when the sorghum growing on its own is drought stress? And we see these things around the world. I mentioned the Jaina experiment yesterday, so I don't want to go into that in any more detail now because I haven't got any time. Russ can't see me because I'm just going to hide down here. So can't make eye contact. But they did find that soil carbon increased with plant species richness. So now more plants, more soil carbon. And remember, so this is what's going on. If you've got more different kinds of plants in there, you're going to build soil carbon faster and it's soil carbon that holds the water. And, uh, and it's soil carbon that's going to be important for the nutrient status. And what they found in this Yana experiment was that their high diversity plots, eight or 16 different kinds of plants together or even up to 60, they weren't competing with each other and they accumulated at least 20% more carbon compared with low diversity plots. And that, that's the key message that comes out of that. Diversity is going to build carbon in your soil and that soil carbon because it's so important, is actually going to replace fertiliser, it's going to replace insecticide and fungicide and displace weeds. So just if I can just have one more minute, Russ, I just want to show you an example from New Zealand. These are young dairy farmers in New Zealand. Attended one of my workshops three years ago and heard about uh, the downsides of nitrogen, decided to stop using nitrogen fertiliser and then last year attended another one of my workshops and realised that they needed to get some more diversity on their farm because they just had ryegrass and clover. And I just visited recently, just last month, on their farm. And this is the kind of soil that they're dealing with. It's a pumice soil, a volcanic soil. It's a really, really light coloured uh, ash, basically volcanic ash. And when it doesn't have plants growing in it, it's that's, that's just what it looks like. And so what they've done is that they've, uh, oh, and, and then this is, that same soil if it's grown with ryegrass and clover, which is mainly what they've got on their farm. And I know that that looks like, like it's a bit sort of upside down. So now I've turned the, the young boys upside down 
and the soil sample is upside down. So you can see the ryegrass, you can see a couple of inches of dark soil underneath it. The ryegrass has actually built some carbon and then you're straight into pumice. And that's the only thing they've ever seen on their farm is at the most, you know, probably four inches of black soil where they've had these uh, ryegrass and clover pastures. Last year they put in a multi-species mix uh, just in five acres. So I haven't got a point about if you see from where the cars are parked down the bottom of the hill, basically, and then coming towards you, that five acres has got multi-species on it. The rest of their farm is ryegrass. And we just went out to look to see whether the red clover had nodulated. That was really the only reason we went in there. I wasn't expecting to see anything and neither were they. Um, so that's Maya with the spade. He's just dug this hole. And uh, when the soil came out, it was all black like right down to the end of the spade. His son is pointing to a tiny little bit of the pumice right at the bottom of that hole. Well, he said, oh, we must have earned a tree here or something. Like he just looked at it and went, well, you know, I've never seen soil like that on my place. We must have earned a tree here. And then he went and dug another hole and it came up the same. And then he dug another hole and then he went crazy and dug about 50 holes. Well, I said, you're not going to have any paddock left here. You're going to dig it all up. He said, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. And all he just kept walking around all day going, I can't believe this. And I think he went to the pub and got drunk because, <laughs> and then I rang him up the next morning. I said, I think we should come back and have another look and just check, you know, the paddocks on either side because for some strange reason, your whole farm could have just gone like this. Like, you know, it might just not be the diversity and the fact that you've stopped using nitrogen. He said, I've already been out there this morning. Um, like this was at six o'clock or something. He said, I've already been out. I've dug another hundred holes <laughs> and they're all the same. So I think he's still excited and that was a month ago. So he's gone from that to, uh, to what you've seen. Now, if we stand on that paddock that he's converted, which is just in the foreground there and looking out over the rest of his farm, which is all ryegrass and clover. He said, I can't wait to change the rest of it. He's got 12 species in there, uh, more non-grasses than grasses. A lot of that is chicory, which when that flowers will be pretty and there's red clover and other things that are, there's lots of flowers in there, lotus and, um, and a whole range of other, other flowering plants. He said the cows are almost breaking down the fence to get in there and then when, he's, when they're in there, he can't get them out. And their milk production's gone up. I mean, there are absolutely no downsides. Why are we not doing this? Because as I explained yesterday, if you look at those uh, fields in the background, the ryegrass and clover, is because all of the advice that farmers in New Zealand are given is you can't manage more than one species. Sure, you can put some clover in there. But if you have more than one, one kind of grass and one kind of clover, it's too complex. You can't manage it. But the thing is that when you introduce the complexity, it manages itself. So I think it's that whole thing about self-organisation and um, Russ is getting anxious. But so I'll just leave it there because I, I love that picture. And we'll talk a little bit more maybe or some questions about what's actually going on in the soil microbiome and and, and how these extraordinary things that we've, and, and why is it that we've been really denied access to this information for so long about this is the answer to all of our problems. But if we go back to the prairies, we saw that's how they function. So why have we ignored that for so long? Good, all right, Jonathan, can I get you to come back up? Let's, um... thank you, Christine.